Hi, I'm Brian. Welcome to a very wet and muddy special edition of Autogafool. We have brought the Kodiak Scout all the way to Macedonia and Bulgaria to find out just how much of an off-road vehicle it really is. Ordinarily, in an Autogafool clip, at this point, we would give you a full profile of the outside of the car. Well, fortunately, Thomas has already done a very in-depth look at the Scout, so if you want to check that out, please look just below and we'll link to it. We thought it would be a little bit more fun to give you a full profile of the car when it's covered in mud. Well, I'm pretty sure you're familiar with the Kodiak by now. There are some styling differences with the Scout. The point of the trip that Jonas and I have come on is to show you that it's not just a styling detail. A lot of cars that claim to be slightly off-road, off-road, really are just road cars with styling packs included. Well, that's not the case with the Scout. We brought it to some really quite extreme locations to show you that. But in case you're not familiar with it already, let's just have a very quick look around and see what's changed from the standard Kodiak. First things to point out are gonna be a slightly different lower bumper here. We have the honeycomb structure here, and a slightly more aggressive looking lower sill. Ground clearance on this car is just below 20 centimeters, and that hasn't changed from the standard Kodiak. We do, however, have slightly different wheels, and that gives us just a little bit more lift. And hopefully, that will make the difference between us being very stuck in mud and not stuck at all. So come on, guys, we've already seen a clean version of this car. This is what it's gonna look like after you've had a bit of fun with it. So what you can't actually see on here is we have black, plastic trim that's obviously going to be a little bit nicer for you to keep clean after it gets nice and muddied up look at the mud we put down on these wheels already we have very special alloys for this car alone and we have special wheels just to make sure that the off-road driving is a little bit more comfortable coming through slightly further we can see we have the scout logo on the side body matching color on top of the mirrors the standard side of the Kodiak, as we'd expect, and in profile, really, the only way you're going to be able to specifically notice that is this trim, which marks it out as being the Scout and these special wheels. Round at the back, again, we have this honeycomb mirrored from the front at the rear and generally the back of the Kodiak as you recognize it. What's nice about this car is that whilst it makes a statement of being rugged and capable, it's not too overblown. So you're going to feel just as happy driving this round town as we are today big smiles, driving it through some pretty spectacular terrain. Let's take a look at the interior. Now, as you already may have gathered, we're doing things a little bit more rough and ready than we ordinarily do at Autogafool. There are two reasons for that. One, the core of this episode is about the driving experience of the car. But two, we have to make good use of the filming slots available, and those are generally when we've had to stop in the middle of the off-road course. Now, the interior of the Scout is gonna look very familiar to you if you've already experienced the Kodiak, but there are some really nice touches in here. Look at these wood effect inlays in both the door and the dashboard. I say wood effect, it isn't actually wood, but it does a nice job of just showing you have something a little bit more than the base model. If Jonas swings around and has a good look at the door, you can see the really nice tasteful way in which those materials have been mixed. I'm actually very thankful, if we go slightly lower down, that we have non-fancy, non-embellished speaker grills here. Why? 
Well, this car should have been completely designed to consider the fact that it's going to be covered in mud. And as Jonas can show you, we have more than a little bit, and I strongly hope we'll have a lot more before the end of the day. But take a look at these mats, talking of mud. We've got really nice lips right the way around them that make sure that whatever mess we get in here is very easy to quickly and easily remove. Skoda's catchphrase is simply clever, and I really like all the details around the car that reinforce that idea. Coming slightly higher up, you can see we've got a nice net pocket here for storage of things. We've got two storage compartments on the passenger side. Both of them are actually quite equipped to hold a good amount of stuff. Here, Jonas has taken the full advantage to store his drone equipment. And lower down, we can see also the multimedia unit that allows us to put in either SD cards or a SIM card for uh, internet or telephone access. Actually, a good amount of storage featured here. Coming slightly further over, we've got a touchscreen of all of the Volkswagen groups. This is not my most favorite of their units. It's very high gloss. That means a lot of fingerprints and navigating it while you're driving is not the most intuitive thing. But don't worry, because what they have done a really good job of is how those controls are integrated into the steering wheel here. So anything that you want to navigate that's a little bit more complicated can easily be taken care of from the steering wheel without needing to worry about this at all. We do have a predictive touch system here. So if I go back to the home screen, you should be able to see how some of those features come up just by noticing my hand is there and maybe not. Generally speaking, the whole idea behind the display here is to keep it as uncluttered as possible. It worked. Thanks, Jonas. <laughs> it did. Whatever I just did, it liked it. Now, that's really of benefit in my experience of almost any car that you own. I don't really want to have to navigate through 500 buttons here and it worked again, just in order to be able to get a sense of what I'm looking for. So yes, maybe I'd like a couple more buttons here to make it a bit more tactile in terms of its control of this system. But at the end of the day, it looks clean, it looks simple, and it is easy to use. Thank you so much, Skoda, for using this straightforward setup for heating and cooling. It's intuitive, it's straightforward, it's within your reach simply as a driver without needing to visually look at it at all, which is the most important thing about any of the controls on a car. We have a very nice, straightforward, well-known shift stick down here. This car features the seven-speed DSG and using this is very straightforward. It feels nice, solid and tactile in the hand and it's very much a pleasure to use. Slightly further down, we have our mode select buttons. As you will know, because we have the Scout, we have a big, nice, friendly off-road button, and we're making more than a little bit of use of that today. Can, of course, turn off the traction control if you want to have a little bit more fun when you're on the road. We have various mode selectors. We'll talk about that a little bit more while we're driving. And, of course, we can turn on or off the automatic stop-start. Now, coming slightly further back, we have a nice cup holder back here with a very convenient place for putting our key. That's excellent because obviously with keyless ignition, that's always something that bothers you. Great, but where do I put the key? I don't want to put it where my mobile phone is stored. So I'm really happy to see that Skoda have actually provided me with a solution for that. Two cup holders. And then I think we know this armrest very well. We can expand it out to get comfort while we're driving and push it back to get access when we want to get at what's in the middle. When it comes to instruments on the Scout, you very much get a similar feeling to the design layout. Practicality is the number one consideration. I personally really like the way we have this blend of both analog and digital. And yes, okay, it doesn't look like the most modern, but honestly, although full digital displays can be very nice, I really like analog dials. And I think in this car, it's great. Now we've driven a lot of miles in this car, and I can tell you, that this digital display in the center, although it might not be the biggest in the world, it does do a great job of providing you with all of the information that you need. And you can pick between so many different things to be displayed very simply while you're driving, which brings me back to the steering wheel. So again, this is not revolutionary. We know this wheel from lots and lots of cars, but there's a good reason for that. It's very comfortable and very usable, and the controls are very intuitive. I have only one tiny gripe, but it really is a very tiny gripe. And that is 
as I mentioned earlier, it's really nice to be able to use the steering wheel controls for the infotainment system while you're driving. And what you find out, if Jonas shows you here, we have the up, down on the volume. Oh, it's such a great feature because as long time viewers will know, I'm a little bit over the need to push buttons when I want to control volume. I like knobs. We don't have a knob here for volume control, but look at this. This wheel is so simple to use while you're driving and it does a great job of controlling that volume. Now, the thing that I like is that when I want to pause the music, you push on this wheel and it pauses the music immediately. That's great. I'll tell you what it doesn't do and that's restart the music after you've paused it. Ah, it's not the end of the world but it just would have been a nice feature to be able to give it two taps just to bring it back on. What you do is simply push in the middle of the screen and that restarts the music. It's just nice not to have to look for that while you're in the middle of driving, but obviously the longer you drive the car, the more you don't need to look at anything and you instantly know where it is anyway. It's not hard to get to, it's just a tiny niggle that I have. Other than that, speech control button, very easy to use. The car is nice and responsive and can allow you access to a whole range of controls just by pushing that and talking into it. And over here, we have the ability to cycle through the system that we already showed you with the digital display right in the middle of the dials. We can also use the controls to make or receive calls. It's very intuitive, very straightforward, and actually a lot of fun to use. Well, if you're wanting a more detailed look around, please do check below and watch Thomas's full review. We're a little bit limited on time here, and as you can see, because of our shooting schedule, the back is more than a little utilized. Well, we have spent a lot of time in the front seats, but what I can tell you is that the back is just as comfortable. If Jonas looks around here, we have the same match styling on the back to the front, the same nice mix of Alcantara and fake leather. Excellent. But what we have special for us, because you know we're spending a lot of hours in this car, is a nice in keeping with the styling refrigeration unit just to hold some drinks in for us. There is acres of space back here. And if you will remember from previous reviews, I'm only five foot 10 or 178 centimeters in height. Lots and lots of head space. Well, if you have watched Thomas's review, you will remember him commenting, and he's over six feet, how much leg room he has back here. Just think, if you were the passenger who was sitting behind me, you could probably fit two people in this space I have available back here. Certainly, I have enough room that my suitcase is actually lying flat on the floor. We have separate air conditioning controls back here for the passengers, including heated seat controls as well. We also have a 12 volt charge point, a USB charge point, and a regular 240 volt socket. So you're pretty much in the lap of luxury if you're gonna be in the back of this car. But why put passengers in here? They're only gonna tell your friends or your wife when you take it off-roading, or your husband. Come on, let's be fair. Well, we took a look and saw what that mud did to the inside of the engine bay. Let's see if the boots fared okay. Well, I'm happy to tell you that the ceiling has kept everything outside where it should be. Obviously, we have the boot full of our equipment, but you can already see how much practical features are packed into the back of this. We have the five seat model, but there is also a seven seat model available. We expect a lot from Skoda in terms of practicality and we've got it. Lots of nice clips for your luggage, really good extra storage areas that you wouldn't necessarily expect. And underneath here, a spare wheel. Well, hopefully we won't be needing any more of those today. As covered in mud as the car is, I'm more than a little bit happy to have an electric tailgate. And I'm happy to be able to tell you, you can also make that open from inside just next to the driver's seat in the door. So if you have somebody jumping out to pick up something from the rear, you do not need to get wet to allow them access to it. Well, now we've got our car nicely warmed up and also fairly well covered in mud. Oh goodness, let's take a look inside and see what's powering it. Well, we have the larger of the diesel engines that are available, that is a two litre TDI. They come in range between 150 or 190 horsepower, producing between 340 to 400 Newton meters. We have the larger of the engines, so that's 190 and 400 Newton meters. They can come with either six or seven speed DSG. If you're keen to know about the petrols, they go from 1.4 to 2 litre, 
150 horsepower to 180, 250 newton meters to 320. Well, as you can see, it gets a fair bit of action when you start taking them seriously off-road. We have put a lot of miles down into this car, and I can tell you, if I was going to be buying one of these, I think I would definitely be wanting to go with a slightly more powerful engine. We've had so much fun, and I certainly haven't experienced what I would describe as an excess of power in any of our situations. It's great for when you get off-road, but on-road, there's plenty of oomph when you put your foot down too. So we've already had ample opportunity to see how the Scout handles on regular roads. We've driven here all the way from Bulgaria and pretty much as we expected and Thomas already said in his previous review, the ride is very comfortable indeed. Well, we're not on road anymore. This is our first opportunity to see how the Scout behaves once the going gets a little bit more challenging. We're high up in the hills above Macedonia and we've just gotten started on our first off-road track. Let's see how the Scout performs. So I've just put the Scout into its off-road mode and obviously that changes a lot about the, how the car is going to behave and react to the environment. As you can see, and Jonas is gonna do some exterior shots so you get a really good idea of just how off-road this off-road is. We have a change display that gives us much more useful information about how the car is performing. Now, the entire way that the car is set up to function when it's in off-road mode is completely different to its regular driving experience. There is a huge amount of computation happening while I'm driving along here to make me feel as if I'm completely making all the choices. Of course, I'm making hardly any of them. In actual fact, the system is working beautifully with the Haldex clutch at the back, more on that later, but what that allows the wheels to do is have a very, very good ability to put the power and the torque to exactly where it's needed when I want it to be there. Now, this section of road has what can only be described as quite deep ravines in the middle of it. Certainly, it is not somewhere you would want to bring a normal car, and quite impressive, to see how effortlessly the Scout is handling this. Not least because earlier on today, we've had the opportunity to take this car, this car at high speed on a disused airstrip. Now, oftentimes one of the criticisms we get when we come out and do off-road reviews is, yeah, that's great, but different tires, different setup, closed course. None of those things apply to this test drive. We have taken this car for, what would you think, Jonas? About 100 miles at least? Yeah. on on-road circumstances, mixed on-road circumstances, I will say, if you've driven throughout Bulgaria, you'll know what I'm talking about. But still, we've had it on standard highway conditions. We've had it at high speed on the airstrip. We got this up to about 190 kilometers per hour. So we know these are not specially set up and we know that these tires, whilst being suitable for off-road use, are also equally suitable for on-road driving. And what I can tell you is the change in handling from on to off-road is actually fairly remarkable. What do I mean when I say that? Well, it's extremely comfortable and well-behaved when you have it on-road. You wouldn't expect it to still feel that way when you get it off. But as you can tell by the fact that I'm able to talk to you in a very comfortable manner, it's incredibly well-behaved. Jonas, you've been in lots of off-road cars. Would you say this is a pretty comfortable experience so far? It is, definitely. Okay, so that's that's good. Jonas, bear in mind, because of the work that he has to do while he's filming, can't spend a huge amount of time looking at the road ahead. And I can tell you, if you know any camera guys, that's the best way to get car sick as quickly as is humanly possible. So that gives you a pretty clear indication of how comfortable this ride is. As far as the electronic control goes, absolutely effortless. I really don't notice any significant changes that the car is making while I'm driving along. And trust me, if you were in a regular car on this surface, you really would. So it's early days yet, and we haven't done anything really challenging, but I will tell you that the guy told us yesterday they had to replace 
15 punctured tyres. So that gives you an idea that the course is not going to be as forgiving as you might assume. Hopefully we'll have a chance to really see what this car can achieve and we're really excited to bring it to you. It's worth mentioning at this point just quite what a good job Skoda have done with this off-road driving driving mode. The real key to getting off-road driving modes right is getting the balance between having your experience as a driver be pleasant and still make you feel that you're in control whilst making sure that all of the variables of the off-road driving experience are being closely monitored and managed by the car. Well, I've been in plenty of off-road vehicles where I felt that you've been a little bit too, if I say mothered by the experience, I think you know what I mean. There's too much control and it's too obvious. What's very impressive about this setup is that whilst you can feel quite how much the car is doing, and what I mean by that is when our transition goes from smooth ground to rough with big dips in, you can feel the car taking control. But what's really impressive is it doesn't interfere with your experience as a driver. So when you put your foot down, you still have the power. Here, I have nothing on the pedals at all. The car is controlling my descent. But the minute I want that control back and I just lightly touch the throttle, back comes the power in a very controlled, precise way. The balancing act is a very delicate one, but I have to say, I think Skoda have done a fantastic job with this. And that's not something that's particularly easy to achieve, especially in a car that you want to spend as much time on road as off. We've experienced an awful lot of rough terrain so far. A lot of sticks, a lot of stones. But right now, I think we're ready for some mud. The first thing to mention about the car that we're driving is that it has not been specially set up for off-road use. And what that means is that the tires we're driving on are very much standard road tires for this car. That makes driving off-road immensely fun. But it also gives us a really good chance to see just how good the real-world application of off-roading is for this vehicle. Now, <laughs> There we go, that was great. We've been told that the best line is usually to follow after the instructor. Now that's a little counterintuitive because as every single car goes through this mud, it makes it a little bit more challenging to drive in the same path. So we are taking our own lines occasionally, but what's absolutely fantastic is that you really can enjoy the experience of slipping around in this environment because we don't have the additional big thick grip that you would get with standard normal off-road tires and that just means that we're going more or less wherever gravity and our power wants us to go to which is hugely fun Brilliantly, you might think that at this point we would be experiencing some difficulties actually getting through what is largely a clay-based mud and a lot of water. I have to tell you, I think Jonas is going to be able to take some cutaways to show you just quite what some of the stuff that we're driving through is like. But it's really very impressive. I certainly wouldn't bring my scout through any of this stuff without having somebody told me first that it was okay. But should you find yourself in a field say at a festival after very heavy rain and absolutely no idea how you're going to be getting out of it, I'm happy to tell you that the Scout has other plans. So you managed to find us stuck in a little bit of mud. Now, sometimes when we do off-road courses, they have been completely prepared for us, which means it's almost possible to get yourself into trouble. Very happy to tell you that on this year's Skoda off-road event, that is not the case. Now we've had quite a lot of unexpected rain, and that's led to some pretty fantastic conditions. What's really nice about that for us is it definitely allows us to see what the car can achieve. And they've been fantastic so far, but unfortunately, this muddy trench has proved to be a little bit too much for us. 
Now, as our off-road course instructor has told us, it's always better to go back a hundred times if you need to, in order to make sure you find the right path to go forwards. Unfortunately, I did not find the right path to go forwards. And what that's resulted in is a slightly stuck car. However, we're very excited that soon we will be able to get it free and then we'll be able to carry on. But in the meantime, what's really great about this is that our support vehicles are all Skoda Kodiaks. So that enables us to see that this really is no trickery whatsoever. This is what the car is capable of. And we're just about to find out exactly how they're going to go about getting us unstuck. You may have heard the expression measure twice, cut once, and how that applies to off-road driving is no matter how many times you have to go back in order to find the right line to go forwards, you just have to keep doing it. Because once you get stuck in a rut, you're not going anywhere at all. So how that applies to us today in mud is that the mud will always want to drag you down to the lowest part with the most water and that of course is the worst place that you can possibly be. So if you start to feel yourself getting stuck and somewhere you don't want to be, just take your time, reverse out and keep doing it until you find the line that you want to get through the mud safely. So unfortunately we're stuck in the mud once again and this time it's a bad one. Our lead car has a flat tire in a very soft area. It's still raining pretty hard so I think it could take a bit of time to clear up. So this is an excellent opportunity for us to tell you all about the Haldex clutch that this car comes with. Regular viewers of Autogo Fuel may be more than a bit familiar with the fact that our technical expert is AJ. Now sadly he can't be with us today but that didn't stop him from explaining to us how it works. This kind of a system, the Haldex, is a way for car companies to provide an all-wheel drive option of an existing front-wheel drive car. So how does it work? Well, the transaxle, which is the differential on the front axle between the front two wheels, there will be another drive shaft or propeller shaft, whatever you want to call it, which goes under the car towards the back uh, near the rear axle. But before the rear axle, before the rear differential, there is this Haldex unit. It's a clutch, it's an electronic clutch which monitors the, the traction control system, the ABS system, and works in conjunction with the hydraulic modulator, which is what is used to pulse the brakes. Um, and then it uses this summation to engage the clutch, the Haldex, or disengage it. So what does all of that mean in practical terms? Well, I think what AJ has just served to demonstrate is quite what a difference an engineering education can have in terms of how you perceive of what the car actually delivers. So what I understand about the difference between all-wheel drive and four-wheel drive is that four-wheel drive allows you to deliver equal power to all four wheels at the same time and that is crucial for serious off-roading. Why wouldn't you want that as standard on cars? Well clearly you have the issue that that's a lot harder for cars when they're cornering on standard road use and the reason for that in layman's terms if you're not familiar with it is that when you corner the outer wheel will always be traveling at a different speed to the inside wheel. That's why we have a thing called a limited slip differential and that allows those two wheels to travel at different speed. That works fantastically well when you're on-road, not so well when you're off-road. And that's why the first four-wheel drive vehicles had wheel locks on sometimes each of the four corners, allowing you to stop that from happening so that power could be delivered in equal part to each of those four wheels at the same time. Now, what we have on here is a Haldex fifth generation. And what that means, as AJ so beautifully explained, is that we can take what was a standard front wheel drive car and through a hydraulic system, which is electronically managed at the back, we can operate braking on all four of those wheels 
to apply pressure as and when it's needed. Now, the original hall deck systems only allowed you to do that in a reactive manner. That meant that when it observed you were experiencing slippage, it would change the way that the wheel was behaving. But in the newest, latest versions, what it means is it's predictive. So if it senses, in harmony with all of the other car's systems, that you're going to be experiencing a problem, it will apply the distribution of that power, that torque, before you even know that it's needed. What does all of that mean in real world terms? Well, it means two key things. Firstly, you can now drive a system with a Haldex 5 without even knowing where, when, and how it's distributing your power. So as a driver, it's effortless. It feels exactly like you're driving a two-wheel drive car because for most of the time, that's exactly what you are driving. It switches up effortlessly without you even needing knowing. And unlike a four-wheel drive that will have usually a secondary stick down here which allows you to switch between those modes so that that transfer box can put that power where you need it in a hall deck system it's all automatic so in sum if you plan on spending most of your time off-road as say a farmer or a person who works deep in the countryside does you're probably going to be better off going with a four-wheel drive system but if you're like me and 99% of everybody else, all-wheel drive is fantastic because it's there for when you need it, which means you have a little ice, a little rain, or you want to go to a festival, you have that at your disposal. But for most of the time, you won't even know it's there and you will still experience the efficiencies of a two-wheel drive. Now, it is worth pointing out that because that split happens further back, when you add a hall deck system, it does mean an extra drive shaft being put from the front to deliver power to the rear. So you are going to lose a couple of miles per gallon in terms of your fuel efficiency. But overall, the system is so good. It's so easy. It's so straightforward. If you think that there's a chance you might be going off road, it is a fantastic compromise between the really, really rugged and useful four wheel drive system and the modern, highly efficient all wheel drive offered here. We've had a lot of opportunity to talk to you about the off road performance of this car but it's also a very good performer once you get on the road. Now, we've finished with our last off-road circuit, and that means we're heading into downtown eventually, I say hopefully, into downtown Skopje. And that gives us a really good opportunity to talk to you about how this car handles in regular conditions. Well, the first thing to mention is just quite how amazingly seamlessly it switches between its off-road driving capabilities and its on-road driving capabilities. This is the end of our trip, so we have now driven over 750 kilometers in this car over a three-day period. And what that means is we are extremely well qualified to talk to you about the comfort of these seats. We've been through streams, we've been up mountains, we've been over every type of rock I've ever had the opportunity to encounter in my life. And I have to tell you, these seats are absolutely fantastic. Not only do they give you enough support to keep you where you're supposed to be when you're driving in a slightly more challenging environment, but for regular driving, they're not too intrusive. I'm not the smallest person in the world, but I don't get made to feel like I'm too big in these seats. They hold me nicely, whilst at the same time making me feel extremely comfortable. One of the drawbacks I often find with electronic seats is that there are so many adjustments, it can take a fair amount of time for you to find something that works for you. Well, that certainly hasn't been the case with these seats. They have three different memory settings, which means if you share your car with somebody else, you never have to experience that pain of having spent an hour making the seat perfect for you, getting back in to find it's completely all gone. You can just get it right, save the settings, and then hop in and out easily just by hitting the memory button. Now, this car is not the base model. The base model comes in at around about 37,000 euro. This one comes in at around about 54. So obviously it has a lot more in terms of features and accessories than the standard entry level model. In our experience, I would say that those things are worth spending the extra for. Those levels of comfort and performance, this car has a seven speed DSG, for example, and the more powerful of the diesel engines on offer, that gives you all the performance you want. Okay, it's an SUV. You can't expect a sports-like car performance out of it. 
But don't forget, we've had it on an airstrip and it went 190 kilometers per hour. Now that isn't bad for an SUV, especially not one that's gonna perform so well off-road as this car does. We've experienced going straight from that environment into extremely rugged off-road environments and the switch has been effortless. I think Jonas would agree with me that the landscape that we've had this car in today, we both kind of wondered how it would drive when we got it back to normal roads. Really happy to say the support team have not touched this car, which means our driving experience now is exactly representative of what you would find if you took it on and off-road and back again. It's unbelievable. It feels as if it never left the road at all. After we obviously got rid of a little bit of the excess mud, it drives perfectly. Now, if you want to be really picky, then you could say that one of the slight shortcomings of this car is it's not quite as taut and responsive as you would like. When you're designing an SUV, you have to make a lot of choices about which compromises you want to make. Bearing in mind that essentially what you're doing is designing a vehicle whose primary function is likely to be road use, but at the same time has to be capable of handling things that are a little bit more difficult. Well, some car manufacturers decide that what they want is to enhance the drive on the road, and that clearly is gonna have something of a bit of sacrifice in other areas. Here, I would say that the overall feel that the designers have gone for is one of comfort and practicality. What do I mean by that? Well, I feel in control of the car, the steering is responsive, but it's not quite as tight and aggressive as I might like. Certainly when you put it in sports mode to drive it, it still feels a little bit gentle. But the trade-off there is that when you're on a long distance drive, as we've just done over the past three days, you really appreciate those bumps being ironed out. I'm still under no doubt whatsoever that I know exactly what's gonna happen when I turn a corner a little bit briskly and I'm still in control of the car but I don't have to suffer all of the bumps, all of the small imperfections in the road. I have to be honest, sorry Macedonia, there are more than just a couple of imperfections in some of the roads, but I don't get bothered by them at all. And that's in large part because of the way the ride has been designed to handle. Now, if you put this car in comfort mode, well, obviously you're not gonna notice any of those imperfections at all. And one of the things that Jonas and I have both been very impressed about is the sound insulation in the cabin even driving off-road with mountains of noise being made by the wheels underneath you you still can hold a comfortable conversation without needing to raise your voice and that feels really nice the driving position is excellent unfortunately i can't show you jonas but he had all manner of fun changing the height of the seat so what's your height jonas uh, 1 meter 93. 1 meter 93, so it's a bit of a running joke between us because I'm so much shorter than he is. But he managed to move the seat. So he was almost right at the height of the ceiling and he said he felt like he was a king driving in the car down the road. So whatever your driving preference is, you're gonna be able to find it. I have really short legs, so I usually sit deeper within the car. That works for me, particularly on an SUV, because it makes me feel that I am within the car and driving it and in control of it. And I like that very much. But whatever your driving style suits better, you're going to be able to achieve that with this car. The ability to change the functionality of it, incredibly intuitive, very straightforward with the steering wheel, really happy with that. All of the controls are very simple to access. One caveat, personally, I didn't find the uh, ability to be able to set and control the, um, I've totally lost my mind. It's been a long day. Uh, also, what do I want to say, Jonas? Adaptive cruise control, thank you. I didn't find that the easiest to control. You can't see while I'm driving, but that control is set back down here. It's not difficult to access, but it is a little bit fiddly until you get the hang of it in order to uh, remember which way you have to manipulate that lever in order to change distance between car in front, adjust speed, those things. But you would get used to that in no time at all. Everything else is really very straightforward. The visibility is good. The B pillar doesn't take up too much of my space at all. So when I want to look around and see what's happening there, it's easy. But I think if there's one thing that I really want to repeat about the drive, it is just how effortless it is to switch between modes. That means that when I find myself with a slightly more challenging environment, I can pop the car into off-road, cruise along as if nothing happened at all, and then carry on about my way when I get done with it. 
and I very much doubt anyone who ever owns this car is going to put it through the torture and abuse that we have over the last three days. But I have to say, I think it's coped brilliantly and I'm very happy that we're finishing up this trip on the road because it gives us the opportunity to remember just quite how much of a pleasant experience it is to drive this car in a normal environment. But of course, if you wanna have a bit more fun, well, that option's always available to you. So sadly, we've almost come to the end of our road trip. That means we're nearly at the capital of Macedonia, Skopje, and we've had quite an adventure getting here. As you can see from our well-used Scout, we have certainly put the off-road capabilities of the vehicle to the test. Now, let's be honest, if you own one of these vehicles, you are not likely to want to drive it in the environments that we have. The whole point of this trip was to really show the limits of this car. Ask anyone who has ever driven off-roading seriously and they will tell you, the most important thing you can have for your vehicle is the right tires to do the job. The tires that all of our vehicles were equipped with were definitely the road standard ones. So we noticed that when we experienced some of the deeper mud that we've encountered on our trip. But that said, the car has coped extraordinarily well. If this is the absolute limit of what you should do with one of these vehicles, then trust me, you're not gonna to want to take it anywhere that gives you nearly as many challenges as we've put it through. I think the highlight of the entire trip for me was probably last night when we took the cars to have them filled up and there was a representative from Skoda who had a big panel LED light only to inspect the undercarriage of the cars to make sure that no damage had occurred to them that needed fixing. Well, even though we have taken this in some of the most extreme places that you could want to, I can tell you that nothing was damaged on any of the test vehicles. So that's not just us, that's the whole fleet of journalists. And yes, as you can see from the roof, we've experienced more than a couple of flat tires, but I think that's only to be expected. So what's the sum up for the car? Well, our test model here comes in at just a little bit over 54,000 euros, but don't forget that is packed with all kinds of extra equipment. The base model comes in at just a fraction around about above 37,000. So nicely equipped, I think you're gonna be looking to spend about 50. What do you get for that money? You get an extremely capable car. Now this comes either with five or seven seats and a good range of engines as we discussed earlier. So you really can have exactly what you're looking for. Does the all wheel drive come at a cost for fuel consumption? Well, it does but I'm happy to tell you that as hard as we pushed this car, both in terms of speed when we saw the airfield earlier and on rough terrain, I don't think we ever saw a fuel consumption figure that was any worse than about 10 and a half liters for every 100 kilometers driven. And for the kind of drive that we've had out of this vehicle, that really isn't bad at all. So who should buy this car? I would say if you're looking at a fantastically comfortable, really well-designed family SUV that will transport you in great comfort around what you'll be doing with it for 90% of the time, but with the safety and knowledge that when you want to take it somewhere a little bit more adventurous, it really will take you there. This is a car that should not only be on your list, but should be very close to the top. It's been spectacular fun to drive and really quite eye-opening for both myself and for Jonas to see quite what the car can deliver, a little bit more than we thought that it might be able to at the start of the trip. Particularly telling for me, the support vehicles that came along with us for this trip were the exact same model and fit out as the one that we drove. That's how confident they were that if we had a problem, it would be something that could be solved by this car. And that's exactly what we found. So. That's two thumbs up from me. That's a lot of fun that we've had and very impressed with this car. I hope you'll have the chance to drive it. And if you do, I hope you'll have a chance to get just as much fun out of it as we have. In the meantime, if you have any comments or questions, please pop them in the section below. Please subscribe and we hope we'll see you again soon.